Welcome back to the Hard Box News Corner. This week, there's been a lot of news come out of IFA, the annual sort of mobile-focused trade show in Berlin. Lots of that stuff is more on the smartphone and laptop side of thing. Lots of new Intel Ice Lake and Cooper Lake laptops, which I won't really touch on in this video, but I'm sure you guys have already seen a lot of the interesting stuff already. What I will be touching on are a number of the big PC-related stories to come out of IFA, plus a few other tidbits that have come about this week. So, yeah. Let's get into this week's big story. Now, normally I don't like to focus too heavily on marketing material that companies produce. I think all of us know what to expect when a company releases a presentation or graphics touting the capabilities of their own products. You know, they wanna put it in the best light possible. They're not gonna put up a representative cross-section of results. They're always gonna cherry pick the data that is best for them. And that's the case, you know, whether we're talking about Intel, AMD, Nvidia, or really any other company. So, you know, I don't really tend to go too hard on most of that sort of marketing stuff. But this latest set of slides from one of Intel's IFA presentations has really annoyed both Steve and myself. I think we feel it's pretty misleading. And to be honest, I've seen this slide used by Intel before and didn't want to discuss it that time, but it's popped up here again, so I feel it probably is time to address it. I am, of course, talking about Intel's real-world benchmark slides that they have used as part of a presentation titled Real World Performance. So first up, here is the slide in question. The entire premise of this slide, I guess, is kind of a decent one. They're trying to illustrate that Cinebench, based on Cinema 4D and one of the most popular benchmarking tools out there, isn't very reflective of real-world performance because it's not an application that most people actually use. Their data shows that the app is only used by 0.221% of people, ranking 1,331 out of the apps they have in their list. They also show that what people are actually doing is using Chrome, Microsoft Word, Windows Media Player, and so on. And on face value, you know, that's fair enough. Knowing what people are actually using is important when it comes to benchmarking systems. But that's about where my positive comments end for this, because overall, this slide is complete garbage. My biggest issue with this entire slide is that the key piece of information is buried in a footnote at the bottom. You see here where it says the source? Well, it has come from 10.9 million systems, except all of those systems are notebooks and two-in-ones. So, yeah, all of them. Um, What's the problem with that, you might ask? Well, let's look at how Intel has structured this presentation. We start here with a slide titled Desktop Leadership, and then they go on to talk about you know, Core i9 processors, they make a few jabs at AMD, they talk about Cascade Lake X, which is the HDT platform. Then we get the real world benchmark slide, and then you know, finally we move into the mobile leadership section. Now, I don't know for sure how Intel presented these slides and provided additional context because I wasn't there, and I'm sure they explained a few more things about this data and its importance. But to me, this doesn't even matter all that much because it's incredibly misleading to go from talking about high-end desktop systems, then straight into a discussion on why Cinebench isn't a valid benchmark, but then to source that data on why Cinebench sucks from mobile systems. And then after that, to then shift gears into mobile devices. Now, this obviously gives the impression that Cinebench shouldn't be used for desktop benchmarking. You might be a little more lenient on Intel if they'd put this slide in their mobile section, but it's not. It's right there after a slide about HEDT systems, but it uses data from a completely different category of devices. So, you know, this is so incredibly important because of course, notebooks and two-in-ones are not a standard use case for Cinema 4D. The majority of laptop buyers aren't buying portable systems to do 3D rendering. That is a workload that desktop and especially HEDT users will perform. Of course, laptop users are primarily interested in running Chrome, Word, Excel, VLC, a whole bunch of apps like that. So it's complete rubbish to then go and imply that Cinema 4D is not a real-world use case for desktop users. The data here simply isn't relevant at all. It doesn't give any insights into how often high-end desktop buyers, say 9900K or 3900X buyers, are using 3D rendering apps. It doesn't tell us whether Threadripper buyers do a lot of Cinema 4D work. All it's saying is something super obvious. People buying slim and light machines often don't run a workload that isn't designed for low power CPUs. This slide simply must include an obvious reference to the data coming from mobile systems. In fact, this large header here that says 
users in this segment do just has to say users in this mobile segment because if this slide is being circulated as it has been, it could very easily fall into the wrong context and be wrongly applied to desktop benchmarks. Omitting that one clarifying word here is criminal in my opinion and changes the entire makeup of this presentation and pushes it firmly into the misleading category. But that's only one problem. The other is that we don't just benchmark Cinebench to inform us exclusively of how CPUs perform in Cinema 4D. Firstly, it tends to be a good indicator for performance in all 3D rendering tools, so that includes Blender, Maya, 3ds Max, and so on. Yeah, you'll get more specific and accurate results from testing each app individually, but on a general level, it's representative of 3D rendering workloads. We have no idea from this data how often 3D rendering tools are used as a whole because we're only seeing Cinema 4D numbers here. On top of that, it's a great benchmark based on a real-world application that is indicative of performance in all sorts of apps. You know, we can't benchmark every single application in existence, so having data from Cinebench can be used in conjunction with other benchmarks to tell us how CPUs fare in heavily multi-threaded workloads with light memory usage. And this could be any number of workloads. And again, while a specific app won't deliver exactly the same performance as what we show in Cinebench, workloads that use the CPU in similar ways will perform in the ballpark of Cinebench bench numbers, generally speaking. The other issue with this slide is this line. Intel is offering help to OEMs and press with realistic usage performance testing. So in other words, they want people like us to test the apps in this list. So let's go through some of them. A huge portion of these apps for general workloads really don't need to be benchmarked. Is anyone really interested in which desktop CPU runs Microsoft Word the best, or OneDrive, Skype, the Steam interface, Dropbox, PowerPoint. We're talking about desktop CPUs in 2019 here. You'll be hard pressed to find a product that doesn't deliver instantaneous level performance in these apps when you remove memory and storage bottlenecks. Performance in these apps is a solved problem, and I'm not sure that anyone tossing up between a 9900K and 3900X wants to know which CPU lets you change the font more quickly in Microsoft Word, for example. They're interested in more performance intensive workloads where the performance difference makes a significant difference. Web browsing performance is obviously one of the big ones here too. They show Chrome at the top of this list. But again, similar to Microsoft Word, the differences between CPUs in real world use cases of Chrome is pretty trivial. And I'm not talking about intensive benchmarks like Kraken, but standard stuff like browsing Facebook or doing shopping on Amazon. Most of the time, unless you're using a very low end CPU, you will be performance limited by your internet connection. And outside of that, there might be you know, a few millisecond differences in page loading. The rest of the apps listed include you know, Excel, WinRAR, Photoshop, and games. And you know, these are genuinely performance intensive tools at times, and apps that most reputable benchmarkers, including ourselves, do use in some situations. I'm not even going to discuss some of the other questionable slides in this presentation. To be honest, this whole thing smacks a little bit of desperation. You know, a couple of years ago when Intel were the performance leader, you never heard from them about how Cinebench, the standard benchmark tool that has been used for a decade, is not real world representative of performance. But now there's genuine competition in the market, suddenly Intel wants to shift the goalposts towards benchmarking apparently Microsoft Word and Windows Media Player. And really, I don't think this slide is about offering to help the press with real world testing. Companies like Intel AMD and others suggesting benchmarks tends to be ignored by reputable benchmarkers because we know what apps are relevant for benchmarking. We already test with a, you know, a decent cross section of workloads and most importantly, you guys, the viewers or readers, if we're talking about a website, tell us and other people how you use your PCs and what you want to see benchmarked. If you guys told us Microsoft Word was a real performance hog and we should benchmark it, we would include it in our day one coverage. Really what I believe these slides are trying to do is actually get users to erode their trust in benchmarks. It's like Intel is saying, you know, don't trust Cinebench benchmarks. It's not representative of real world performance. Yeah, we might not look good in these tests up against AMD, but you just can't trust them. Only trust benchmarks from our pre-approved list of realistic workloads. And 
To be honest, it's not a good look. We don't like it. We don't like companies dictating which benchmarks they claim are real benchmarks and which are you know, not representative. And we would call out any company that tries to pull this sort of thing. You know, We've done it in the past when AMD exclusively tested CPU gaming performance at 4K. We felt that wasn't representative of how CPUs would actually compare for gaming. And you know, we'll do it every single time this sort of thing pops up. Now, I'm not saying we here at Hardware Unboxed are perfect. You know, we're always trying to learn and improve our testing methodologies, but we'll always listen to you guys, the viewers, the buyers, the PC builders as to how we should be testing these products and what you want to see. We certainly won't be listening to what Intel sells is a real world benchmark. We'll be asking you guys, you guys tell us in the comments below and we see those comments. So thank you for doing so. And that really helps us out for creating the benchmark content that we think is relevant and gives a good idea of how various different products perform. So right, that's that topic done. Let's blaze through the rest of this stuff so I don't have to spend years editing this episode of News Corner. The actual Intel news, out of E for concerns, the Core i9-9900KS, which is coming in October. This is an up-clocked version of the 9900K, bringing the base up from 3.6 to 4.0 gigahertz and increasing the all-core turbo from 4.7 to 5.0 gigahertz. So out of the box, it can do what people, you know, what most people will overclock the 9900K to. So no word on TDP, presumably that's higher than the 9900K, and there's no word on pricing either, but you'd expect it to be a more expensive and binned version of the 9900K. Intel will also unveil Cascade Lake X in October, which is the successor to Skylake X on the HEDT platform. The big goal here is to improve the relative performance per dollar, with Intel touting a pretty meaningless at this stage, 1.74 to 2.09 times improvement, allegedly making it better than AMD's current Threadripper line. No idea if this is current market pricing or MSRPs, you know, what workloads they're talking about. So it is kind of a bit meaningless. What it should indicate though, is that Intel will either be significantly increasing performance at the same price to up that value metric, or they will be dropping prices. Given we can't see Cascade Lake X bringing huge performance gains, it's still a 14 nanometer part, you'd think this will be a price Price cut to bring it in line with what AMD is doing. Of course, Cascade Lake X won't be competing with second gen Threadripper for long. They'll also have to go up against AMD's Zen 2 based Threadripper, which will no doubt increase the bar again for HEDT systems. AMD has released a statement concerning the current controversy around Ryzen 3000 CPUs failing to reach their boost clocks. Not going to read the entire thing, but basically they acknowledge that there is an issue in some situations and are working on a BIOS update for motherboard partners that will fix the problem, with more to come on September 10. We don't know whether that will be the launch date for the BIOS or whether they will just provide an update then, but at least AMD has finally acknowledged the problem and are looking to fix it. If you want to hear more of our thoughts on the overall boost clock problem, of course, we've got our initial investigation up on the main channel, and Steve also has a few behind the scenes videos up right now, giving a casual look into things from our perspective. You can access that if you are a BTS subscriber on our Patreon page. We have a few more light Threadripper rumors going around. Apparently Threadripper 3rd Gen received PCI SIG certification back on August 23rd, so that means it will have PCIe 4.0 support as expected. No idea on firm launch date yet, but we do also see a few more TRX40 references popping up this time from MSI, so that information seems a bit more solid than it was last week. And thanks for video cards for collating some of those rumors today. Phaser has improved the display HDR specification, introducing a new version 1.1 of the standard that tightens up a few things for HDR displays. While it doesn't kill the useless HDR 400 tier, much to my disappointment, which you know we know those displays can basically just be SDR displays, there are some improvements to the upper tiers like 600 and 1000. Specifically, display HDR 600 now requires 12 stops of dynamic range in a checkerboard test, aka around a 4000 to 1 contrast ratio, which will make it much harder for poor quality panels with weak local dimming to hit that figure and get Display HDR 600 certified. Display HDR 1000 needs 13 stops or an 8000 to 1 contrast ratio, practically eliminating edge lit dimming from this tier, and there were some edge lit panels that were previously certified under this banner. There are a few other improvements as well, plus the new addition of a Display HDR 1400 tier for ultra bright HDR monitors with the best dimming capabilities. Hopefully there will be an easy way to distinguish between the new and the old Display HDR certification metrics, especially as the old method can be used right up until May 2020. And finally, gaming laptops are start to come out with some of the fastest displays on the market. Both Acer and Asus have new models with 300Hz displays with 3ms response times. 
No word on which company is making these panels, but they are presumably TN and will be an alternative to some of the new 240Hz IPS options that have come out recently. 300Hz shouldn't be a big upgrade over 240Hz when you're talking about, you know, a millisecond or so difference, but it's always nice to see things advancing. That's it for this extended news corner this week, but you know, we just really needed to cover that annoying Intel slide that's been doing the rounds. Steve and I had a good chat about that earlier today and yeah, well, you know, we've said everything in this video. As always, subscribe for more content, like the video if you enjoyed it, support us on Patreon if you want to, grab some merch like this. We have our new website that we've set up for that, redirect link store.hardwareunbox.com and we'll catch you in the next one.